What's up, guys? This is Chloe Pavlik and Brandon Rhodes, and you're tuned in to The Work. Today, we're honored to have a great guest, Malcolm Brogdon of the Indiana Pacers, former Rookie of the Year and an amazing man, activist, and really fighting for the community here and abroad in Africa. Thanks again so much for coming on today. Um, I don't know if they told you, but you know, we always kick off the show with our pinnacle question, which is, when did you first realize that you were black? Oh, I, I realized I was black from a young age. I was named after Malcolm X. Uh, so being black is, is who I am, it's what I represent, um, it's what I stand for. Okay, so you were, you were destined to kind of go this activist route if, if you were named after Malcolm X. Was that, was that kind of an expectation in your family growing up? Was that something you were surrounded by? Yeah, you know, my grandfather uh, marched in the civil rights and, and led protests and was, a, you know, a, a, I guess a, a big piece of it. So for me, it was in my blood, um, maybe not to be, you know, an activist and out here, you know, doing some of the stuff I do, but, um, but to be all about the black community and to represent your people the right way, um, that, that is how I was raised. And specifically to Malcolm, because I know you mentioned your your grandfather, who was the pastor of the oldest black church in Atlanta. What did you really take away and learn from him when you were growing up? Uh, he so you know, I Malcolm X was always my role model from afar. Um, but my grandfather was my Malcolm X. He was my Dr. King. He was sort of the epitome of um, standing up for what you believe in, no matter who's standing against you. Um, and, you know, that's what he did. He dedicated his life to uh, black people and the cause. And, um, you know, he, you know, forever in my mind will be my legend. That's amazing to be surrounded by that. My, my great uncle was the pastor of the oldest black church in Grand Rapids. So I kind of can see where you're coming from and some of those shared experiences. But that's amazing to be from where Dr. King is from, to be named after Malcolm X, to grow up in this environment. But I want to ask you, you know, you went to UVA and I want to get a little bit of your experience there, you know, going to, um, you know, we talked a lot about the HBCU movement on the podcast and just kind of different athletes experiences at PWIs. So I'd love to hear more about kind of your experience there and, and how it went. Yeah, you, you know, my mom, um, you know, I've had the sort of the best of both worlds. I grew up in Atlanta, um, which everybody knows is a, is a uh, you know, a lot of. Uh, black people doing really well for themselves. But my mom has been a professor, a dean, a provost at Morehouse College for, you know, 25, going on 30 years. Um, so my brother went to Morehouse. Um, so I, I grew up in the AUC. I grew up on campus every day after school uh, with my tutors were Morehouse students. Um, so going from that to a PWI, uh, definitely a culture shock. But, you know, I went to for three years of my high school, uh, you know, my, my high school career here in Atlanta, I, uh, I went to um, a private school. So it wasn't as much of a culture shock for me as it would be for, for a lot of guys, but um, it's definitely an adjustment uh, being in an environment like that where there are not a lot of black people. Um, and the, the black people that are there, a lot of the time they're not, they're not like you. Um, they're, they're a little bit different. Um, so, you know, I had a good experience. I really did. Um, what I tell people is I didn't have the experience of a regular black person at, at a big PD, PWI like that. Um, I was privileged, to be completely honest. I was a star athlete. I was a basketball player. Um, I was also a good student. And I was held to a higher, a higher standard, standard and put on a pedestal. And, you know, I benefited from that. People treated me different. They didn't treat me like a regular black person. Um, so, uh, and I was, you know, aware enough to, to understand the, the, the um, situation that I was in. But I, overall, I had a good experience. Uh, if I could have gone back and I wasn't an athlete, I'd definitely go to an HBCU. Um, no doubt in my mind, just seeing the um, experience that my oldest brother had at Morehouse and my other brother had at Howard, there's, it's unparalleled. And it's great, too, that, that you mentioned that your older brother's experience um, at an HBCU and now that we see more and more athletes starting to consider attending HBCUs, what advice would you give to them when they're trying to make the decision between a PWI and an HBCU? Um, man, I, uh, you know, I was raised to go get the best education possible. 
And that's what a big part of my decision was going to UVA. It's a, you know, a, a very good academic school. Um, one, I would tell them, go get the best education possible. Go to a school that when you leave, people can look at your degree and say, oh, he's, he's going to be intelligent. He's going to be informed and educated because of, you know, where he attended, uh, you, you know, his university. Um, but at the same time, go where you can get a diverse experience. Go where you can be uh, a little bit uncomfortable, but also be, you know, just be exposed to different people. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's hard to go from an, to be picking between an HBCU and uh, especially for NBA and NFL players and guys that, you know, want to specifically in those sports, because when you, you're picking between an ACC school or SEC school and an HBCU, the exposure you get from those big conferences is, is unparalleled. Um, but there are huge benefits to going to the HBCU. You're a big, you're a big fish in a small pond. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really what you value. If you value education, um, you know, it can, it can clear up a lot of things. Yeah, oh, actually, I, you know, in just researching about you and reading about you, it seems like education is just a huge pillar of, of you and your family and your background. And one thing that struck me is that you, you know, got your master's in public policy at UVA, right? You didn't have to do that. You knew you were going to the league. But, you know, talk about that. And, and I think you kind of mentioned that it was to help your dream of ending, ending world poverty which is super ambitious and cool. Um, so, so maybe talk more about why you wanted to get that degree and, and kind of what it was for and how it's helped you. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, um, when I was growing up, I was blessed enough to travel to Africa, to travel to Ghana, um, Malawi, South Africa, um, and more recently, Tanzania. But um, I was able to see the poverty that people were living in halfway across the world and to see how blessed I was and to see how much need there is out there, how much you know, how many resources that I have that other people don't that I can help them with. Um, so for me, basketball has always been the dream, but it's always, I've always viewed it as, man, once I make that money, once I have that platform and that voice and that light, I can really help other people. I can use that for good. Um, so that's always been my goal, you know, helping people and being in Africa and doing work like that is my passion. And that's my real passion, not basketball. Um, but when I was in college, I played my freshman season. I got injured at the, end, at the end of my freshman season. I broke a bone in my foot and um, I had to redshirt my whole second year. And I knew on the back end, if I didn't leave early for the draft, I know on the back end I'd have a fifth year. Um, so immediately in my second year, I applied for a master's degree um, in a public policy and leadership program because I knew public policy like um, legislation is the way to uh, really affect policy is to affect change. Um, you've got to change laws. You've got to you know, affect it at the highest level. Um, and, you know, it ended up being a, you know, a very honestly intense program, um, that I basically finished my fourth and fifth year, um, while at UVA. And, you know, it, it, it was a lot of work to finish my, my bachelor's degree and then be working on my master's at the same time, as well as trying to, uh, make it to the MBA. Um, but it was so worth it to, to push myself, um, on the educational side and, um, it, it really paid off. Yeah, that's it. It's amazing that you were able to do both, um, especially being someone that has my master's. I, you know, I could barely keep up with my full time job while I was pursuing that. So um, huge kudos to you, Malcolm. And on top of that, something that really stuck out to me that you said is, you know, that this is your passion, right? These clean water projects for Africa. Um, versus basketball being your passion. And when you think about NBA players and guys that make it to the league, what, what do you, do you think that NBA players should have to play a role in helping things like clean water projects and different things like that on top of playing basketball? No, I do not. I think NBA players and I think professional athletes across the board to do what they're comfortable with and do what they're passionate about and do what they care about. Cause at the end of the day, I think if you force people to um, partake in something like clean water or something outside of their sport that they don't actually care about, they're not going to give it a hundred percent. And it's not going to be done well, like anything in life, if you're not really passionate about it. Um, so I, I definitely would say, you know, for the guys that, that are passionate about other things, give them the opportunities, open the doors for them, give them the connections so that they can really explore it. But for guys that aren't, let them let them, you know, be 
passionate about basketball and really focus on that. That makes sense. That makes sense. I, I think um, I want to dive more, though, into the Africa piece because, look, we have so many things to talk about with you in terms of, um, you know, social justice here in the U.S., but that's one thing that really stuck out, right? So you went on this trip when you were a teenager, and, like, what, what did you see that sparked this whole passion area around clean water? And tell us more about kind of what you're doing to, to impact it. Yeah, so, you know, um, you know, I remember walking around in the, sorry, my dogs. I remember walking around in the villages in, uh, in Accra, Ghana, um, in the communities downtown, um, and seeing other kids my age. I was nine or ten, seeing other kids my age without shoes on, just walking around. And it was puzzling for me. I couldn't really comprehend it. Um, and then later in the trip, we were there for three weeks. We went to another city in Ghana and we got, we get off the bus and there's uh, a bunch of kids in the field playing soccer. They're all around my age. And I was a big soccer player when I was younger. It wasn't basketball, it was soccer for me. And my, my, my parents were like, go down there and play with them. I'm like, go play. I didn't speak the same language, but it was one of those situations where you force your kids to be uncomfortable and go figure it out. And I went down there. And when I got down there, I realized they were playing with an orange. They didn't have a soccer ball. They were playing with a piece of fruit. And for me, that was just like, oh, man, like, where am I? Like, and, and still, you're trying to comprehend it. You can't really at that age. But then it, it, it sort of dwells on you years later. And you're like, man, if, if they just had a soccer ball. Like, and you're thinking, like, think about all the talent that's over there. All the, all the kids over there that could come over here and dominate if they just had the resources and the opportunities. Um, so little things like that. There was another time when we were in Ghana. That trip was just like, it was my first trip there and such sort of monumental things stuck out to me. Um, we were on the bus and while we were in Ghana, um, the group that we were with, we, they would hand out our food, our lunch while we were sort of on our tours throughout the day. And they would hand it out on the bus and we had these styrofoam boxes where we had our lunch. It was just basically chicken and rice. And the people on, the people, you know, outside the bus that were, you know, um, uh, the Ghanaians in the city, they could, especially the ones that, you know, were poor, they could smell the food on the bus. And when they realized that there was food on the bus, they're banging on the windows, just trying to get, because they're so hungry. And we start just handing out our food, just giving them our food. And they're literally breaking the boxes as we're handing the food out. And kernels are dropping on the ground, kernels of rice, and they're picking up the kernels and eating them. And I remember looking at that, just being like, this is, the, I mean, I'm a child, but this is not right. There's, there's no way people should be living like this and as much food as we eat and waste in the U.S. and as much food as we have, there's no way people should be living like this. Um, and then as I got older, as I, you know, when I got my master's degree, that actually put into perspective, you know, um, what, how I can actually help people. And clean water is such a huge deficit in a lot of countries and a lot of places, especially in Africa. Um, I knew that was the way I really wanted to get into um, helping people to start. That's an, that's incredible, and especially too for that to for you to see that at such a young age, and then continue to want to help develop over there, and also continue to give back. And I'm just curious. So, when you were younger, right? How many times have you been back since then? Like, how often do you go back? Because, like I said, I know you have these projects, and especially with certain things. How many times have you been back to Africa? Uh, so I've, I went to, I went to Ghana, then I went to South Africa, then I went to Malawi, and then I went to Tanzania the past two summers. Um, and you know, I go back every summer now. So every off season, I go back to Africa. Um, I was supposed to go to Kenya this season because I mean, this summer, because we, um, just put our first well in Kenya. Um, but of course COVID hit, but it's, it's something that I, I want to continue to do every summer. Um, last summer I also went to Senegal. Um, I went for basketball without borders. It's really, for me, any opportunity I can go and see and, and see and, and meet people in Africa. And even if it's just, you know, helping with basketball camps, I, I go. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a every summer thing for me. I love that, man. I, I really need to get there to the continent. And I was, I was helping out with Seed Project over in Senegal just through the U.S. Connect. And I've like, been wanting to get over there so bad. So I'm, I'm excited to go at some point. Yeah, it's a, it changes your perspective, man. You got to. Yeah, we'll we'll make we'll make it happen, no question. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit more to the U.S. because uh, obviously you're you know a vice president of the MBPA. 
Uh, we know it's well documented what went down last year um, leading into the bubble and social social justice and, and the George Floyd murder, um, Breonna Taylor, all these things happen and you were kind of at the center of that. Um, so maybe just walk us through a little bit kind of the timeline and, and the mentality that you guys had going into the bubble and kind of some of the things that you're working on now to have a lasting impact out of that, you know, that spark. Sure. Well, you know, man, going into the bubble, I don't think NBA players or the public um, or anybody on the outside really realized that the bubble, there was a huge possibility the bubble wasn't going to happen um, just because the, the executive committee that I'm on was not going to agree to the terms with the NBA because we had specific um, points that we wanted to push. We had specific messages that we wanted to push during the bubbles and, and see specific things happen. And um, you know, it was a, it was a rocky negotiation. Absolutely. Um, just to, to come to terms with the NBA because there are things they want to see and, and there are ways they are and aren't going to bend. Um, and there are ways we are and aren't going to bend. So, um, it was a rocky negotiation getting there and, and a lot of, a lot of emotion. Um, and because so much had just happened, we had just had, um, uh, Brianna, we'd had Brianna Taylor, we'd had uh, George Floyd. Um, so emotions were high going into it. And then to restart the season during all that, there were some players that just felt offended, that opted out, that were just like, this isn't what I'm going to prioritize right now. And then there were players like me that were like, um, no, this is an opportunity for me to use my platform. This is an opportunity for me to uh, uh, further my voice for those that don't have uh, the light on their situations. And it's also an opportunity to make that money that can transform communities. If you use it in the right way, you make money that's that that can transform um, you know communities all over not just yours but all over the country. Um, then we got to the bubble. We agreed on the terms, and it really did play out for the players. It played out exactly how we wanted it to. Um, you know the the NBA I think did a good job um, coming to terms with us on most of what we wanted, and um, you know I think we did have, we actually have an impact. You know when you see you know uh, former uh, when you see Donald Trump you know, commenting on what the NBA is doing and caring that much about whether it's disrespectful or not, that means we're having an impact. And that's what we wanted. We wanted an impact. We wanted to make noise with what we were doing and how we were demonstrating. Um, and then after, you know, we're, we're going to continue to push that message. The bubble was such a, for us, we knew going into the bubble, it was such a unique opportunity to, uh, to, to demonstrate, to shed light on those issues right then and there, because it was such just an opportune time where, and it was so fresh. Um, and I thought, I thought we did a good job. I thought, and we'll, we'll, continue to, we'll continue to use our platforms. Yeah, I, I think it was huge, Malcolm, because the biggest thing, I feel like what happened in the bubble and prior to the bubble is you guys organized, right? You organized, you mobilized, um, and you brought an agenda and you made ass and the NBA was obviously um, all about it. And then you guys continued to carry that momentum into the season and you talk about civil rights leaders having full-time jobs but also doing the work how do you think you and other nba players can continue to sustain this not just through this nba season but for future seasons to come oh um i think we have to continue to be demanding i think we have to continue to organize like you said um i think that was actually the key we were able to organize uh, you know there were um, long, big discussions with uh, a lot of NBA players on the on the call before the bubble, deciding if we would go, deciding what the what the parameters would be if we were going to go. Um, and there were some heated discussions and guys that disagreed. But I think that's what you need uh, in moments like that to make a good informed decision. Um, and I think going forward, we have to continue to organize. I think it's especially with the PA. I think the the executive committee is huge. Um, there's a seat open, Pau Gasol is leaving. Um, and, and I think there might be one or two other seats open. And I think it's time for, you know, we got to continue to pick good leaders because I think that executive committee has a lot of leadership. Um, Chris Paul's seat is going to be up for the president. We got to pick a good president that can lead us. Um, and, you know, Michelle Roberts is stepping down our executive director. So it's important that we fill these roles with the right people so that we can take the right steps going forward um, and continue to, you, I mean, We've made enough noise. Now we're known as the most progressive league in the world. And now we got to live up to that standard. And we should. We should happily live up to that standard and continue to make noise. 
love that. I love that. So I, I want to ask you, um, you know, in the NBA and in college, you've had a lot of accolades associated with basketball, but you won the 2020 NBA Citizenship Award. So I want to know, you know, how that felt and how that kind of stacked up with kind of Rookie of the Year and other awards you've been able to get so far. Um, man, it, it felt great um, to see your work acknowledged and just see your effort acknowledged. I think the Citizenship Award is all about effort and, and caring about others and trying to make an impact um, outside of yourself. Um, to see that acknowledged and, and given a nod is great. Um, but, you know, comparing it to other things, it's not something that's glorified. It's not one of the awards where they're like, oh, man, like, can I get your autograph? Like, it's not like that. Um, but for me, it's, it's everything. It's, it's what I, it's my passion. It's, it's everything I stand for. It's, I don't stand for basketball. Like basketball is my, is my, uh, I heard someone once say, uh, rent your title and own your character. Like that's how I view that basketball. I'm renting basketball right now and I'm owning everything, my passion, everything I do off the court. That's what I own. That's who I am. Um, so to get that award is monumental for me. It's bigger than basketball for tuning in you just heard about the incredible work that malcolm brogdon is doing and this week's work is to check out the brogdon family foundation their vision is to create a more equitable world by empowering children families and communities to reach their potential in the future so check them out go to the website brogdonfamilyfoundation.org and thanks again for tuning in and subscribe on all your favorite platforms yeah yo i'm trying to tell you the gear is fly, the gear is hot, the gear is it. Get to it, click the link right here while I work on my handles. Hey, ha ha.